If you have your Bibles, I will take my text from the first letter of John. I do thank God for the season. However, I will not be preaching a Christmas sermon today. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, when you found it, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? I believe it vital at times that we as believers reestablish some facts, some truths concerning our faith. And contrary to what some would argue, the Scripture does set out facts and truths that the believer can review when his faith begins to need some additional support or affirmation. And in the letter of 1 John, we have set out for us some absolute statements about what we know and how we know it. And so the title of today's sermon will be, Look Who's Here. Have you ever been at an event and all of a sudden someone bent over and whispered in your ear, look who's here. The implications with that statement are that the latest arrival has caused the whole gathering to take on new significance. It can be a positive thing. It can be a negative thing. It can be an awkward thing. It can just be a thing. It can actually be an exciting thing. But look who's here. It's something to keep in mind as we read the discourse today. First John chapter 2 and verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrist, whereby we know that it is the last time. Look who's here. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for your grace today. We want to thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your word. It is a bedrock that we can stand upon. And I pray that for the next few minutes you would anoint my mind. You would give me the ability to communicate clearly and concisely with your people. And I pray that your word will do its work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. There are two things. Two things we must establish early as pillars upon which we can lay a foundation today in this sermon. A, in order for this sermon to reaffirm your faith, you must believe that the Bible is the holy, infallible, written word of the living God, free of error in the original manuscripts. There can be no equivocation in your mind if you want this sermon to give you any reaffirmation in your faith. The second thing that we must Establish is that in order for the sermon today to reaffirm your faith, you must believe that the author of our text, 1 John 2 and 18, wrote the truth and had firsthand knowledge of these things. For indeed, he makes that claim in 1 John 1, 1 and 3, saying, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. He writes, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So with these two beliefs established and serving as pillars, that the Bible is the infallible, inerrant Word of God, and that John actually was a witness and wrote truthfully about what he saw and heard and experienced and knew, we can proceed to lay a foundation as we journey through this text today. So let us consider a couple of things that we will throw down as foundations and bedrock together. First thing I want to consider is the last days. We encounter the phrase in our text, you have heard that it is the last time. 
the last time or the last days is not a New Testament invention. You read more about it in the New Testament than you do in the Old, but it is not a New Testament invention. In fact, the concept and the phraseology heralds to an earlier time in the Old Testament when the prophets spoke directly and indirectly about the last day. For instance, in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, we read, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. John takes for granted that his readers knew the written and the oral prophecies concerning the last days and that they believe in those prophecies. For he writes, little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know it is the last time. This teaching of the last days is brought over and greatly reinforced from the Old Testament into the New Testament by the words of Jesus and the writings of the apostles. So what exactly are the last days? How do we define the last days? The last days are the final days of planet Earth, specifically and possibly the entire cosmos as we know it. The Bible teaches us this. The last day era will end in cataclysmic disaster. Peter spoke of this when he quoted the prophet Joel in Acts chapter 2, verse 17 through 21. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So here is how we define the last days. It really depends on the persons involved. For the believer, the last days is the final days of our pilgrimage on earth. The last days among unbelievers, the last days through which we must endure temptation and be bombarded by hell and heathens. It is the final hour before we can drop this body of flesh and receive a glorious body. It is the final hours before we will be permitted to enter into the presence of Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. For the believer, it is the last hours in which we will be required to look upon suffering and endure sickness. It is the last time that tears will course down our cheeks. We will bear our last burdens for the souls of men. We will utter our last warnings, shout our last encouraging words, spend our final sleepless night, and then it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. The last days for the believer is something that is to be anticipated, something that we are to pray for, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. But for the unbeliever, the last days are not that pleasant. They are not that enduring because for the unbeliever, the last days are the final moments of fleshly gratification. It is the moments right before the party ends forever and darkness cloaks them like a thick curtain. It is the last laugh the last profane words, the last immoral act, the last unholy thought, and the final unrighteous deed. It is the final days wherein mercy extends her arms and pleads for them to come. It is the last moment before eternal torment inflame their senses. It is the moment before before terror turns into horrendous and fright. It is the time when the human race are making their wrongs right in that final moment. And for the human race at large, the last days are those final hours before the cup of their iniquity flows over. It is the last moments that injustices and violence in society will be covered up and ignored. In these moments are the last moments wherein man will be permitted to play God. These are the last 
days. These are the times of which the apostle is speaking. It is the moment when all things are culminating and all things are growing in the direction where God wants them to go. It's almost like watching a swirl, a whirlpool form in your bathtub as it drains and the water goes further and further down until finally a little whirlpool begins right over the drain and everything in the wash begins to be sucked inevitably toward and down into the abyss. It is those moments that we refer to as the last days. And John said, friends, I want you to know that the last day is here. I want you to understand that the believer must be making final preparations. We must make sure that our lamps are trimmed and burning. We must make sure that we're walking and talking with Jesus. We must make sure that we make all wrongs right and that we love the brotherhood. We must make sure that we're spreading the gospel to the lost. We must make sure that we're not lethargic and sleepy and lazy because it is the last days. And whether you like it or not, honey, it's coming. The end is drawing near. Prepare to meet your God. Let's deal with the Antichrist. Most people are familiar with the teaching of an individual Antichrist that will make his appearance in the last days. Scripture talks about this person. Second Thessalonians speaks about the lawless one who is to come. In, first Thess- in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 9 through 10, Paul writes, Even him, talking about Antichrist, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. It's the moment of final delusion. The Antichrist will be the epitome of illusion. He will cause people to believe in a lie and they will not be saved. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, he writes a warning. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is at that, so that he as God sinneth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Revelation speaks in depth in chapter 13 about this individual who will be the Antichrist. But the word, the word Antichrist is found only five times in the Bible. And each occurrence is found in the writings of John. And each time, John uses the same Greek word for Antichrist. And it is a Greek word which can and does mean two things. 1 John 4 and 3, John reveals to us that he uses this same Greek word in two different senses for we read. Watch this. In 1 John 4 and 3, every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. It's not a person. It's not one individual. It's a spirit that is working through Many individuals, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Look who's here. So here's the bottom line. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, we read, Little children, it's the last time, and you've heard the Antichrist will come, and even now is he here, and thereby we know it's the last time. The first Antichrist in our text is a re- reference to the one everyone is so familiar with, the individual who will rise in the last day and require the mark of the beast, among other things. But the remaining four uses of the word Antichrist in John writing and the second use of the word in our text refers not to an individual, but to a spirit that works through individuals. For the word antichrist in the Greek means two things. It can mean a man who will show up in the last days. And concerning this individual antichrist, many makes the mistake of believing that when the antichrist comes, he is going to reject the idea of Jesus and ban religion altogether. In fact, the scripture teaches the opposite. 
The scripture teaches that the Antichrist will not be against the idea of a Messiah, but will proclaim that he himself is the Messiah. He has fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures. The second meaning of the word Antichrist is a person who sets himself in a place of Christ, especially implying and usurping of Christ and his position. So in our text, the first Antichrist means the individual man that we're also familiar with. But the second Antichrist speaks not of an individual, but of a spirit that is opposed to Christ and seeks to usurp Christ's role as the head of the church and as the authorities of, on matters of godliness and many other things. But you must understand that in order for the spirit of Antichrist to oppose, usurp, and to undermine Christ in his teachings, it must have the use of human bodies. It has a difficult time doing what it desires to do among men unless it can work through humanity because most people would not be very favorable or enjoy uh, the naked spirit of the Antichrist showing up in your bedroom in the middle of the night and saying, I am the Antichrist. So he takes a more subtle approach and he uses or commandeers human beings. He commandeers people with, that is well known, people with power, people with status. And this is a fact. If you are a religious leader, you are a target for the spirit of Antichrist. He wants the leaders of the church because through them he can deceive the laity in the mass. Think with me. Why is it that many well-known Christian leaders start well preaching sound doctrine? But after they become well-known, after they have been established as a leader in the national and international Christian community, they go off the tracks and begin to preach heresies. I tell you why. The spirit of Antichrist targeted them because he needed their mouth to speak through and their pen to write through so that he could deceive all who follow them. Let's consider the era. Let's refer back to our text. John tells us something that's certain. Little children, it is the last time. You have heard that the Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. John says to the church, you have heard about the last days. You have heard that the Antichrist will come in the last days. Look who's here. Connect the dots, little children. The agents of the spirit of Antichrist are all around us. In fact... You can't hardly go anywhere where there is not some vestige of an antichrist at work. It works in our schools, in our colleges. It works in Walmart. It works on your TV screens and on your radio. It works everywhere. The spirit of Antichrist is among us. In March, chapter, in, in March of 1966, an interview with John Lennon of the Beatles captured his remark. This is what he said. The Beatles are more popular than Jesus. What he meant was when Jesus Christ has faded when Bible doctrine has been ripped from society, rock music will still live on. Some of the greatest antithesis that you will find to Christ and Christian doctrine is found in music. Here's a quote for you. I don't argue the concept of a God. I just state the fact that if one existed, as the old book state. Jealous, vain, misogynistic, genocidal, racist, child-killing, women-beating, etc. I would consider it an enemy, and I would want it dead. Ricky Gervis said, It's almost as if the Bible was written by racist, sexist, homophobic, violent, sexually frustrated men instead of a loving God. Weird. 
Of course, this manifestation of the Antichrist spirit's not hard to discern. But there are other ways in which the Antichrist spirit manifests which is harder to recognize. We see it in the way in which society is attempting to reject the biblical morality established by God and in its place establish a morality which allows for each individual to do as he or she pleases and declare it moral. It is the setting aside of God as the authority on morality and putting man or men into that place. In fact, whether you know it or not, friends, we are in a cataclysmic shift at the moment where the last vestiges of godly morality is being besieged, bombarded, and there is a struggle between the men of earth as to who will be the next authority on the subject of morality. You see the jockeying between positions from what is called the extreme left and the right between what those who hold to some vestige of scriptural morality and those who reject all scriptural morality. And you see figures being pushed forward to see how much support they can gain. And if they don't seem capable of becoming the authority that is accepted among humanity, they are pulled back and another person is thrust into their place. It is a trying out. It is a period of, of trying to figure out which person will be able to become the authority on morality in this world. And could I tell you that eventually they will find one person around whom the whole world will convalesce. Coalesce, I'm sorry. And they will become the authority on morality. And when that authority of morality is established, they will then take the steps to stamp out, to suppress, to persecute all those who do not bow before the new authority of morality. It is the spirit of Antichrist. Look who's here. In past decades, we have seen this spirit at work in the world at large, at work in our nation, at work in our religious organizations, at work in our churches, and at work in pastors, church leaders, and laity. Believers are not immune to the spirit of Antichrist. How many times does Satan bombard your mind with thoughts and question the validity of Scripture and cause you to wonder about the existence of God? How many times in a day does he accuse God to you? How many times does he try to take the godly statements that we have lived by and are hair to for so long and for so many years and he tries to show them to you in an unfavorable light, in an old-fashioned tent so that he can move you away from the bedrock of Scripture to a more acceptable view? Beware of anybody who says my views are evolving because if your morality is established in Scripture, the basic premise on issues where the Scripture is clear should never change. It is only when the spirit of Antichrist begins to work in the brain, in the heart, the soul of a person that their views begin to change. And it is subtle and it is slow and it is something that, that they don't even really appreciate doing themselves at the moment. But soon after they make the switch and they move away from truth, then deception sets in. And before you know it, they believe the lie that they're propagating and they believe what they say and they try to become teachers because the Antichrist needs a mouth. It's a sign of the last day. So what should be our response? What should be our response? We can look around us. I don't need to go into all the organizations. I don't need to go into quotes from all the famous people. I don't need to put pictures up. You, you're smart enough to know the spirit of Antichrist. Look who's here. If you're wondering what age this is, it is the last day. 
It is the time when deception will be at an all-time high. It will be pushed energetically, trying to deceive as many people as it can. So our response must be this. Be careful to not be deceived. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. You remember that Matthew chapter 24 is the chapter in which Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple, the fall of Jerusalem, and other things that will happen in what is termed the end of the age. And here he starts his discourse. At the fourth verse, saying, take heed that no man deceive you. The last days is going to be inundated and permeated with deception. And if you don't know your Bible, and if you don't have a relationship with your God, you are the prime suspect. For the enemy of deception and the spirit of Antichrist. It's not a time for Christians to be illiterate concerning the Word of God. It's not a time for Christians to be estranged from God. It's not a time to walk around without the Holy Spirit moving in your heart and in your life. Because we live in a world that is inundated by the spirit of Antichrist. And the Bible says that unless the days were shortened, the very elect themselves would be deceived. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care if you have taught Sunday school. I don't care if you are a preacher or a teacher. You're in danger in these last days. Get it out of your mind that you can never be shaken. The he that Think of him, he stands, take heed lest he fall because there is danger in these last days. And Jesus says, be not deceived. The second thing that we must do is watch and prepare for the coming of the Lord. This is a forgotten doctrine in the church. We hear very little about the rapture. I guess because we don't really believe in it anymore. They used to preach the rapture when I was a kid. In fact, they preached it so much that when I got home from school or something and went in the house and couldn't find my mom and dad, I just knew it had taken place. <laughs> you kids don't ever have that problem, do you? That's not the first thing that comes to your mind because we've not taught you like we should have about the coming of the Lord. But the Bible still says that there is a coming, a rapture, when the saints will be caught away, when all who know the Lord Jesus will be taken, rescued from this planet earth. We need to watch. We cannot be afford to be lulled into sleep and thinking that the Lord delays his coming. Because if we adopt the mindset that the rapture is a long way off, we're not going to be prepared for the coming of the Lord like we should. Oh, if, if we thought the Lord was coming on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a Wednesday night, these pews would not hold the people because we wouldn't want to be caught out of church on a church night when the Lord came. But because we don't believe he's coming anymore, shoot, Sunday morning sometimes is good enough. If we thought the Lord was actually coming, we wouldn't be watching some of the TV shows we're watching, listening to, to some of the music we listen to, doing some of the things we do, going to some of the places we go. We have lost the doctrine of watching and preparing for the coming of the Lord. But don't forget, the coming of the Lord will happen. It is not a matter of if, it is a matter of when. And we are in the last time. And when you read eschatology, this last day is consummated by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must be ready because we won't have time to get ready once the trumpet. 
Jesus wrote concerning this. Watch ye therefore, pay attention. We live in a world that can't pay attention for nothing in their life. I mean, we just absolutely cannot pay attention to anything. Always scrolling through their phone and don't know what they're looking at. Always communicating and ain't sure what they're saying. Can't read a book anymore because can't focus that long. Can't really get anything out of the service because our mind just won't stay with us. We can make our bodies sit there, but our mind's gone. How many of your mind's just somewhere else right now? Ah, oh, dang it. You're too smart for that. I tried to trick you. It's, it's surprisingly easy how, how, it's surprising how easily you can get people to raise their hands in church. But you was, you, I was too smart that time. We are in a generation that cannot pay attention. And Jesus said this, watch, be vigilant, pay attention to what's going on around you. If you pay attention to what's going on around you, you will know the Antichrist is here. And you will know by his being among us that the last days is upon us and the coming of the Lord is very near at hand. It's even at the door. Watch therefore. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. The third thing we must do is pray always. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. You've got to be in prayer in these last days for a couple of reasons. Number one, that you will be accounted worthy to escape the destruction that's coming on the earth. Number two, that God will hold back the forces of the Antichrist until he comes back to get us. Somebody said, well, I'm not worried about what's going to happen in this world. Bless God, I'm going to be out of here in a few days. Well, you better rethink that. Because we don't know the day or the hour. We just know it's imminent. Our grandmothers and grandfathers didn't know. They thought it was imminent too. But thank God they prayed about the things that was going on in their world. The spirit of Antichrist that they seen, they prayed about it. They attack it. They spoke out about it. It was like playing whack-a-mole. Yeah, they would hit over here and then something would pop up over here and they'd hit over there and it's that way today. But friends, we can't get weary in well-doing. We've got to keep on praying about the things that is happening in our world, in our nation, in our churches, and in our homes. Because the spirit of Antichrist is stronger today than it was just 10 years ago. It is shocking how much clout the spirit of Antichrist gained in eight short pray. We must be praying always. The third reason we must be praying always is that we will not be deceived or grow weary and quit fighting. Jude says it like this, beloved, building up yourselves. What? Building up yourselves. What an oxymoron. If I'm tore down, then how am I going to build myself up? It's like David saying, and I encourage myself in the Lord. What? I was discouraged, but I encouraged. Do you have a reservoir of encouragement somewhere? It's like the old saying, pulling yourself up by your bootstrap. How are you going to do that? Building up yourselves. God says, I know it's not in you, but I have resources untold. If you want to be built up, 
You can use my resources, but honey, you're going to have to reach over and grab a hold of them and claim them and bring them into your life. If you're weak, I can put all the food you can ever eat around you, but you will not get strength until you actually start eating the stuff. We are complete in him who is the head of all principalities and power. Everything we need is to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ, but we got to reach out and get it and bring it into our lives and let it become a part of who we are. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Now, here's another problem. Holy faith is pure faith which can only be acquired through sound doctrine. So if you're building on unholy faith or partially holy faith, you're in trouble. It's like the, the house that was built on the sand. When the floods come, the wind, it's going to wash out from under you. And when that happens, as Jesus said, pray that your flight be not in winter. So, building yourself up on your holy faith. Your faith has got to be solid, in line with Scripture. And then when you have that, you can build up on your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. But could I tell you that before you can pray in the Holy Ghost, you have to pray in English? I get so weary of Christians who the first thing they do when they pray, a call to prayer, they just start praying in tongues. And you know by their lifestyle and the things they say that there's not that relationship there. If you never pray in English, you're incapable of praying in the Holy Ghost. It just ain't happening. Because you have to get into the Spirit. But there is such a thing as praying in the Holy Ghost. And it's very, very useful for the saint. If his life is right. If the relationship is solid. But don't ever think that because stuff is coming out of your mouth, it's a prayer. Even if it's being uttered in the posture of prayer, we can stay on our knees and never pray. We can just say words. And the devil isn't scared of your words, no matter how pious they may sound. But he's scared of prayer. The Antichrist can work while you're on your knees unless you you are really praying. In fact, I find that the devil some, does some of his best work when I'm on my knees trying to get my mind into the spirit of prayer. He's there to resist you. Look who's here. 